Welcome back to the channel folks and to another painting guide, another Team Yankee painting guide and as you can probably guess by looking at this, this is one of the new NATO releases, the Leclerc tank for the French. Battlefront sent me this example to do a quick paint up and guide for you guys in time with the release to maybe inspire you and give you some ideas for how you might want to approach the painting of this large and impressive looking tank. Now this is quite a comprehensive painting guide, there's a, a lot I'm going through here folks. It may be of more or less interest to you, from the airbrushing to the detail painting to the weathering, but hopefully you'll find it a useful guide for the Leclerc tank itself and just for your Flames of War Team Yankee painting in general. I do have more Team Yankee guides planned got a couple right away. In my mind one of them is another release for the NATO forces and there's probably going to be some other ones in the coming months as well. So I've created a specific playlist for them folks. If you want to check the playlist section you'll see what I've got done so far and keep up to date with the new guides as they come out. So if you want to keep up to date with all the new Team Yankee guides that we're going to have on the channel and you've not already done so you maybe like to subscribe and turn on notifications and you'll definitely not miss anything then. Let's begin with the assembly folks. First of all the tools. Now I use these modelling snippers, clippers, whatever you want to call them. You'll notice that they've got very thin jaws very thin blades on them which means you can remove pieces from the sprue with as little left as possible. Now you notice here this blade is actually quite blunt. I prefer working with a blunt blade when I'm working with plastic kits. First of all because it's kinder on your fingers and it's kinder on the kits as well. Basically you're less likely through any little mishaps to gouge as much flesh or as much plastic with a blunter blade. Now I'm using two types of glue as required. I'm using ordinary thickish liquid glue plus the thin liquid glue. The thin can come in handy for certain small parts and also for certain areas that maybe need a, just a bit of encouragement, small gaps, a bit of encouragement to tie the pieces together. Now as you can see there's not a hell of a lot of pieces for this kit which is very good and I always start with the turret plug. When you are attaching the plug to the underside of the turret you have to make sure it's centered properly. You have a recessed area around the plug and then a raised area around where the plug is inserted into the hull. So you have to make sure that these all tie up. It's not just a question of getting the plug roughly in the middle. So I apply the glue and then put it to the top of the hull whilst it's not assembled. So I can easily push the plug back out if it's tight and that means we're going to get a really good accurate fit. I always recommend a dry fit when you're working with a new kit folks. There are some areas that might need some encouragement, might need a little bit of extra pushing or a little bit of extra glue at some point in the process just to tie it together and a dry fit will allow you to become familiar with how everything goes together. Now I found assembly of the Leclerc very straightforward, it's a well engineered little kit folks. You won't find any real issues. It was really quite quick. Worth noting is I used some of the thin glue on the exhaust because it is in two parts split between the top of the hull and the main body of the hull. So that thin glue applied there allows you to squeeze those two pieces together for a nice firm bond. I also used the thin glue on the turret hatch. I find that if you place this hatch in position apply a little bit, not too much, of the thin glue around it and it just flows around the edges of the piece and holds nice and firmly in place. So overall folks it's a very straightforward and quick assembly of this kit which means that I can now quickly get on to the painting which is the part I enjoy the most anyway. The NATO style camo that we're going to apply here, the same as the box art, is a hard edge camo and I typically create that using a mask and airbrush. You can use the ordinary hairbrush, shall we call it that, to get the same look. The reason I use an airbrush 
is because I can get a flatter finish, a smoother finish all over. But a brush, if that's what you have got and you don't want to use an airbrush, can be used just as effectively with a bit of patience. I'm using Bluetack as a mask here, it's something that I've always used. There are subsequent to me using Bluetack, being products on the market that do something similar, but Bluetack works, so I'm not going to buy a product for something that I've already got covered. You, however, can go out if you want and buy the particular modelling masking putties. When masking like this, I always ensure that there is a good undercoat and then the first layer of paint that's been applied has dried on top of the undercoat for a day before I start masking. That will ensure a nice solid attachment to the kit itself and reduce the risk of paint peeling as you are removing the mask. Now I recommend you use the colour palette that is in the NATO book, which is Vallejo paint. It's black grey, flat brown and medium olive. Now you can see here I've already applied the coat of black grey to the kit and now I'm masking it. But you might want to ask why that colour first? What colour am I going to do next? So as a rough guide I tend to start with the first colour being the colour I want the most control over. That's the colour that in many cases often got the smallest camel. In many cases it might be the colour which is just most dominant against the background of the rest of the tank. And by starting with that colour, I can be sure that it is going to be in the right proportion to the overall finished look. And then the final colour, it's quite often, for me, it's simply going to be the, either the, the dominant colour or in many cases, the colour that the wheels are going to be. And that way, when we're spraying, we don't have to worry about the wheels, the final coat will cover them nicely. So the order I'm going to be spraying here is going to be black grey, flat brown and medium olive. Now when I've been looking at images of the Leclerc tank online, they seem to use the same pattern on every tank. And that is not unusual, you know, it can be a factory applied pattern. So that will present a couple of challenges when we're doing the masking because we want to try to be accurate. And we also want to be consistent as, as much as possible over the entire platoon that we're doing. So you're going to have to be quite circumspect on how you are applying the masking and make sure that you are referring to images, to the box art, to the painting guide and such like to make sure that you're on the right track. There may be some areas that you can't see from the pictures, but don't worry about them, like the back for instance. Don't worry too much about that. As long as it's broadly accurate, folks, it's going to look good. And there you go folks, that's it masked, ready to go. And now remember folks, what you're seeing there is the blue tack is going to be the black grey. The black grey is going to be another colour altogether. And you'll probably find the first one will take you a bit of time, but then the second one, third one and so on, you'll get them done a lot quicker because you know where your camel patches are going to go. I've not recorded the airbrushing of the paint here folks because it's just spray it all over. You've got to make sure that the edges of your blue tack are down quite tight folks otherwise you might get a little bit of bleed underneath and soften the edges a little bit but here we go just sprayed all over with the flat brown ready for that then to be masked after i've given it sufficient time to be touched dry then we're back to more masking once again following the images and painting guides that we've got to hand. Now there's not as much mask required here for the brown. It's quite an accent colour rather than a dominant colour such as the black grey. And this is the last mask we'll be applying because we're going to spray the green on top now, which means the black grey is already masked, the flat brown we're now masking, and then the green will cover everything that's left. Now there's a little tricky area around the gun mantlet here folks where you've got to get your blue tack into little thin sheets so you can just tuck it in between the components but otherwise it's really just about making sure across the camel patches that your edges are down quite tight you know don't do it too tight because then you will find that you'll start to push out little lumps on the side of the patches just try and get it down tight in one go so the masking is a lot quicker with the 
flat brown and we're now ready to spray the medium olive. Once the medium olive is touched dry, the fun bit starts so to speak folks because we can start revealing the camo that we have created. Now when you're doing this, when you're peeling the blue tack off, be careful first of all you don't scratch the surface accidentally. It's easy fixed but the, the less fixes we have to do the better. And also depending on the kit, it's not an issue for this one, but be careful with components that are easy to pull off you know, side panels, little pieces of detail and such likes. I typically don't mask over little pieces of detail that have been stuck on, you know, glued on individually because they can get peeled off. In this case though, we've had to follow a specific pattern, but thankfully everything is quite solidly attached. And you'll note there that for some areas I used a cocktail stick to pry off little bits that are hard to reach or that are just want to stay in place. The important thing when you're doing that is make sure you use a cocktail stick because it's not as hard as a piece of metal is and push the blue tack itself. Don't try to get under the edge of the blue tack because that will result in a scratch. Just push the blue tack and it will move off together. And you can also pick off little lumps of blue tack with a big lump of blue tack. Just dab it carefully to the surface and it will pull the small piece away. So there we go folks, that is a good representation of the NATO camo on these Leclerc tanks and it's a very flat surface that we've airbrushed onto so that the subsequent painting will be nice and smooth. And overall I'm happy with the results. There are a couple of issues there always seems to be when you are masking but then subsequent painting will take care of most of it, though I did manage to get the camo out of line on the turret there folks. The next tank won't have that problem and it's not going to ruin the overall look. Now I could see some areas where there's a little bit of a softness to the edges that could be tidied up with a little bit of paint if you want, but in this case it's not too bad and the subsequent painting, the weathering, the washing, the highlighting will take care of it. So let's move on to that. Now it's time for some brushwork and I'm painting the lower area of the vehicle which has got a hell of a lot of rubber. So we've got the skirts, we've got the tracks themselves which are mainly rubber pads and then you've got the rubber road wheels. Now I don't want to use just one colour for all those areas, I want them to stand out a little bit against each other. So I'm using German grey for the rubber skirts dark rubber on the track pads over an undercoat of German grey, that's just for shading. And remember to do the internal area of the tracks, not just the outward facing areas. And then black for the rubber road wheels. Normally I wouldn't use black on rubber on the track area because it's just such a strong colour. I mean black is going to stand out really strongly. But here that's actually going to work to our benefit because I've got rubber tracks, rubber skirts. So this will help frame the wheels a little bit. And then I'm going to be picking out all the little links, the areas that are metallic as opposed to covered in the rubber pads. There might be other areas in the track that are visible around the pads for instance, but we're not worried about that folks, we're not going to see that. What we need is for the eye to see the little metal clips and pins that are on the edge of the track standing out against the rubber pads, so it's a very easy and straightforward job. And one last piece of brushwork before we move on to a coat of gloss varnish, it's going to be olive drab on the fuel barrels on the back. and it's good that it's olive drab because it's going to be a nice contrast against the, the rest of the vehicle. Shows them to be optional pieces of kit that can be attached. You could even do different shades of olive drab on each barrel you know, for just a little bit of extra distinction between the two of them. To give a bit of extra shape to the overall look. And then when that's done folks I will be giving the tank a careful coat of gloss varnish using my airbrush. You don't want it to be on too thick folks, this is just to give a bit of protection to the lower area of the hull that's in contact with the board and also a nice smooth surface for the wash. Here's a quick look at the hull before we apply the wash folks, just so you can see how things are coming along and be clear on where we are up to this point. 
You may or may not be familiar with pin washing folks, but it's a way of applying wash to panels, raised or recessed features in a very accurate way. I'm going to be using an acrylic product here, not an enamel product. I prefer this for a number of reasons and I'm really pleased that this is available. That's MIG Ammo Acrylic Wash. As you can see, we've got to give it a good shake and then I'm going to use a palette to start working it. As you can see, I'm working with a palette here. The paint comes out a little bit too thick for a controlled pin wash when it comes out of the bottle. You can use it for any number of weathering processes at this thickness, but I find it's better to add a bit of water to one of the little cups and then add the wash to the water till I have the consistency that I'm confident will give a good flow on the figure. As I've mentioned before, the kit has had a thin coat of gloss varnish sprayed all over. Remember folks, gloss varnish is like a filter. It will darken the surface a little bit, also help unify the surface in terms of the colours a little bit as well. But if you put it on too thick, A, it's going to darken it too much and B, it's actually going to be a little bit difficult to control your wash on the surface. As you can see, I'm using a long thin brush and I'm drawing it along panel lines. Now you can see how easy that is. You know, this paint has a good capillary action and it's got a good flow. So you can draw along the lines, draw around the features and it clings to those features. The gloss varnish helps in that respect. And I also find it compared to an enamel product, this acrylic wash is very accurate and takes less cleanup. I can do some tanks with absolutely no cleanup whatsoever. However, if I do have an area that is perhaps the wash has spread onto a flat surface, I don't want washed, I will clean it up immediately with a slightly damp brush. A lot of patience and the right mindset is required when you're applying a pin wash, folks. A tank of this size to an experienced painter like me is going to take about 20 minutes to complete. Now that can start to wear on you, you know, feel as though you're not making progress, but it's worth it to stick with it because the resulting shade and then the highlight, as you'll see, we're adding later, is going to provide a very strong contrast and make all the individual panels and features really pop on the tabletop. Another advantage of this acrylic product is whilst it can be reactivated and cleaned for quite some time after it's been applied, even the next day if it's been applied thickly, it's also workable very quickly. Whereas an enamel product, you would probably have to leave it till the next day to make sure it's fully dry because you've got an oily surface from the thinner that has been used. So with this acrylic wash, I'm going to be able to quickly move on to the highlighting process. As part of the weathering, I also want to add a wash to the tracks and to the running gear. I'm going to use the ochre wash from the same acrylic range. I'm going to apply this quite thinly to the wheels, the tyres and to the tracks because I'm going to come back once it's dry and put another wash where it's needed. I want to control the level of dirt on the vehicle. This might sound a bit crazy folks but I like a clean looking dirty vehicle and by that I mean everything is done with a purpose clear in our mind when we've started so that we can clearly define the weathering as opposed to just making the whole thing look dirty and it losing its shape and definition. So I'm just checking out the wheels to see where a little bit more wash is required and you can see folks this is not super dirty here. We can still clearly see the, the, all the constituent colours of the lower hull and that's our plan. Having spent so much time carefully applying a wash to create all the panel shapes, we're going to now spend a bit of time carefully applying highlights. Now we have a tank with three colours here, but I'm not going to apply three different highlights. I'm going to use one highlight colour for the whole tank. That's perhaps counterintuitive, but this way the highlight will go across in a broken line, but it will go across the entire length and depth of the vehicle and that will help bring it all together. If you highlight with lots of different colours, 
it starts to break the whole vehicle up into areas that don't necessarily make sense because the highlight isn't going to be picking out panel lines and such like, it's going to be picking out colours. So I'm going to use green grey as the highlight colour. We've got black grey on the vehicle, we've got a green on the vehicle and we've got some brown on the vehicle. Now that means that the green and the black grey they're going to be very well highlighted and the brown is going to be just lightened rather than strongly highlighted but it's going to be sufficiently clear a highlight to help define the shapes of the panels and such likes on the brown areas. I find green grey to be a fantastic highlighting colour folks. There's very few things that it can't highlight to be honest and it's particularly good in these situations where you have multiple hard edge camels. It's a colour that's not saturated but it lightens the edges but it doesn't brighten it too much. You know we're not adding colour to the edge we're just adding a highlight that catches the eye. Now you'll notice that I am not painting the entire edges of all the panels and all the shapes. I'm just bouncing the flat of the brush along the panels, paying more attention to the corners because that will really help create shape. We don't want to over define things so it becomes too blocky. The eye will see the highlights moving along the top of the vehicle for instance or along a line of panels and it will look less harsh if you make that a broken line. Just as with the wash though, we have to be patient folks. This is something where you can very quickly start making mistakes, start just putting on too much paint and getting the lines on too thick if you start to feel fatigued. So if you need a break, just take a wee break, walk away from the desk, come back to it and get stuck back in again. Now we're going to weather the hull folks. I'm going to be using that acrylic wash again from Megamo. I'm not going to be using any thinned wash here, I need it to be a little bit thick because I want to be applying this in very controlled ways on flat surfaces. The intention here is to create a streaky hull. I'm not going to worry about leaving dust on flat surfaces because then it starts to get a bit messy folks. That's where you've really got to go for it with the weathering and start to get heavy all over and as I mentioned before I'm after a clean weathered look here. You know it sounds a bit contradictory I know but I want my running gear to look clearly weathered, the hull to look clearly weathered and for them to look distinctive from each other. So I'm using the dark brown wash, the ochre wash and the dust wash and as you can see I am putting little dots along the top edges of the areas that I want to streak. Then using a brush which is just a little bit damp if it's too wet it's just going to spread the wash over the surface so it just has to be a little bit damp to draw down the wash. As the wash takes some time to dry we can obviously keep working it. So we're going to work it until we're happy with the softness of the streaks. You don't want them being too sharp. They're going to be soft rain marks and because it's rain remember that goes straight down. Curved areas are a little bit tricky to work with but think about gravity folks and keep it natural so the lines make sense and don't look as though they're just wandering off on their own. It's important that you don't overdo this. The streaking is an accent to what we're doing, it's not the dominating feature. So we don't want to start obscuring the camouflage and such likes. And larger areas such as on the front glasses here, I will do the first pass, let it get touch dry and then I'll come back and see where I need to accentuate or soften you know so that you're not having to do it all in one pass because large areas like this will need a bit of attention to get it just right because this is going to be one of the, the most visible areas on the completed vehicle. The turret is quite tricky on this kit because A it's so big you know you've got to have the temptation to put streaks all over it and it's also got so many different angles on it you know, the, the panels don't just all flow down the side. Some of them are flowing internally, some are flowing back the way, some are flowing down the side. So don't overdo it on the turret. The turret is likely to be less messy than the hull. Just put enough in to set it against the backdrop of your main work, which is on the hull. 
You may be more familiar with enamel products being used for this type of weathering effect, and I've certainly used that in the past, but I prefer working with acrylics. First of all, because they are acrylics, you don't have to use thinners. You use the same bowl of water that you've used to clean your brush. They also dry quicker. You know, they dry slow enough in this particular wash so you can keep working it. Enamels will let you work it for longer and possibly get you softer and more subtle effects. But we're working with Wargaming kits and we don't necessarily want to go off into modeling Wonderland when we can get nice looking effects on the tabletop using acrylics and working faster. And now we can move on to some detailing. Thankfully, there's not a lot of detail on the kit in terms of spades and tools and such likes. Vision blocks, that's one of the most important ones. So I'm going to use blues for this. I'm going to use ultra marine and azure. Now the azure should be just a tiny little highlight in the corner, for instance, try and keep it in the same corner, same orientation for each block, just to catch the eye. For the two large sites on the turret, I'm going to be using Highlight Russian Tank Crew from the Panzer Aces range. It's a, a light pastel -y kind of blue, with a highlight of deck tan in the corners once again, just to give it a bit of shape and a bit of a glint. You could also, I suppose, go really dark on that, uh, as a, a different kind of glass from the vision blocks, but it might not stand out quite so strongly, so you've got an option for the finished look there, I suppose. For the various headlights and indicators, I'm going to be using Azure with a highlight of deck tan, and then red. Little spots of detail like this stand out from the background of the overall tank and help just focus things in a little and give it a bit more shape, you know, like defining corners, defining the front edge and the back edge and such like. The Coax and Turret MG, I'm giving a shade colour of German grey. And then I'm going to layer up from there, first of all starting with Luftwaffe Uniform. This can give a nice metallic blue finish to the piece. And with the German grey shade, we're starting to, to define the shape of the turret MG. And for a highlight, I'm going to be using very, very thin lines of deck tan. And that'll just help bring everything into focus on what is a small but noticeable, significant a little bit of detail on the turret. And I'm going to use those same colours on the radio and ten amount. On the rear there is a tow cable, but I'll keep that a bit more toned down. It's just going to be German grey with a little bit of highlight of London grey. The ammo box on the MG I'm going to be painting with olive drab just as we did for the oil drums. On the barrel there's a cloth covered area. You can see that in the sculpt you can see it's got folds, you can see it drooping down a little. So I'm going to paint that using my standard layering approach, starting with a shade colour, which is olive drab. That's the colour ending 889. I think it's now called olive brown, but that'll be the shade. And then I'm going to layer up through using next the main hull colour, which is medium olive. This is going to take a couple of coats off the medium olive to get to the solid coverage that we need, but you'll note that I'm leaving little bits of shade in the folds to accentuate the shape of the material. And for a highlight, once again, just to bring everything into focus, I'm going to be using some green grey again, folks, here. Now there's one last thing I'm going to do in the way of weathering, folks. That's going back to the airbrush and giving the very lowest areas of the hull and areas around the track a very fine dusting. I'm using Panzer Aces Light Mud for this and I'm masking off the track area so there's no overspray. It's, there's no way of doing this without overspray unless you do some masking. So a piece of paper, or in this case like a post-it, slipped up behind the side skirts works a treat. It's really quick and effective. And you can see here the difference between the two sides. 
I'll also use masking when I'm spraying the mud guards because once again there's track behind them and I don't want the tracks to look any more weathered than they already are but the areas of hull beside the tracks I'm not going to use any masking for that there might be a tiny bit of overspray onto the tracks but nothing that we need to worry about here folks so after that folks it's just going to be a coat of matte varnish to seal everything and that's us done as usual I'm going to finish off the video with some still pictures of the finished tank so thanks for watching folks hopefully I'll see you all on the next one